Thank you. Right. Thank you for coming to the presentation today. Forward-looking statement. So we are a patient-centric biotech company focused on gene and cell therapies targeting unmet medical needs and vaccines uh, for public health. And we have three first-in-class platform technology, starting with the modifier gene therapy platform targeting ophthalmology diseases, rare diseases, as well as diseases that affect millions. Our first program targeting retinitis pigmentosa and Leber congenital amaurosis uh, that's uh, going through very well through phase one, two. Our goal is to move the program into late this year, early next year into phase three um, um, when we get concurrence from FDA. The next two programs, OCU410 uh, and 410ST got activated. They got cleared by FDA, two more INDs. We've got three programs in the clinic. And uh, OCU410 targets dry age-related macular degeneration. 410ST targets target disease. An inhalation platform for vaccines, um, this is, uh, I mean, based on the current vaccines, what you have, you have um, issues preventing transmission and durability. And uh, um, this platform, um, we're very excited about it. I think uh, they have potential to um, you know, prevent infection, transmission, as well as durability up to one year. So when you have respiratory um, you know, viruses, if you can get mucosal antibodies in the system, you can actually prevent where the virus enters. So that's a good concept. And uh, recently, we're excited that uh, NIAID picked us as a part of the next-gen program and they'll be conducting the early stage clinical trials for us. And, and the cell therapy platform, it's a regenerative cell therapy. Uh, in a cartilage repair space, there is only one product in the market space. And uh, um, most of the products used uh, are either graphs or uh, you know, commoner devices. And the differentiation is we are the company with uh, you know, 3D technology. I'll go into a little more details a little later in the presentation. Once again, we have regenerative medicine advanced therapy designation for this product, and uh, we're planning to initiate a phase three next year. And so now I'm going to spend more time on our gene therapies and a little bit on our cell therapies. So what is a modifier gene therapy? I mean, when you talk about uh, traditional gene therapies, you know, you got a non-functioning gene, you give a functioning gene when you start expressing, yeah, you control the disease progression. Um, however, you're assuming you don't have any cascading effects because of the defective gene. So there is a lot coming out with epigenetics. And uh, so you can have twins in the same family, same genetic mutation. One may have a severe disease. Another one, if you look at the phenotype, may be very mild. So you really have to think about it. In ophthalmology space, you take photoreceptors. I mean, they're really important for taking the light and transmitting the signal to the brain for image. And uh, when you give a functioning gene for a defective gene, you're assuming there's no cascading effect. If there is something going on, if the photoreceptors, the core, gets continued to re degenerate, then a few years from now, it may not exist. So the gene therapy may not work the traditional way. So the modifier genes are, these are nuclear hormone receptor genes. They have ability to control the functional network from cell development, inflammation, metabolism to survival. So what they do is they reset the homeostasis at the molecular level, cellular level, and uh, they restore the function. They provide a healthy environment for cells to survive because photoreceptors are non-dividing cells. That's why when we age, some of them degenerate. That's why we have vision loss. So that's very important. So because of that ability, we may be able to um, address many inherited retinal diseases with single product. Uh, we had a publication in Nature several years ago. Now we're demonstrating that gene agnostic approach works in humans. So RP and LCA, there are about 125,000 patients um, in US, 1.6 million global, about 125 genes. It's a devastating and debilitating disease. If your parents have it, most likely you'll get it. And by mid-40s, most of them become legally blind. So there is a sense of desperation. There is no way um, our industry can develop 125 products. There's only one product got approved five years ago, addresses only less than 1,000 patients in the US. 
So that's why there is a really necessity for a gene agnostic approach to take care of this population. So we believe um, our RQ400 first program, which is going through phase one, two, with a single subretinal injection, potential curative therapy can take care of these patients. So we have completed uh, uh, in the RP portion of the study, dose escalation and also dose expansion, total 18 patients. We are currently recruiting CEP290, which falls under um, uh, labor congenital amaurosis, about 25 genes there. And uh, we are planning to initiate phase three clinical trial by the end of the year or early 2024, um, based on discussions um, with FDA this year. So I'm going to go through um, the recent results um, we shared with the market. The, this program, what are we monitoring in primary safety? Uh, you look at uh, subretinal administration to immune responses, systemic distribution. The exploratory endpoints, you know, you want to look at you know, some of the things, um, the functional vision, as well as how you can improve quality of life. So best corrected visual equity, that's standard, you check it. And low luminance, because LLVA will give you, most of these patients lose their peripheral vision, they lose the night vision, eventually they'll have central vision, they'll lose that. And so there are the measures, like the mobility test is a good measure, and uh, with the, you know, as you're going into dim light, um, you're looking at, you know, how they can pass through a test, mobility test with, with obstacles. And uh, that can improve the function. If I can walk, you know, in my house, you know, cross few chairs without hitting anyone after the therapy, that's an improvement. You know, I can function better. So, uh, the, the safety so far in this clinical trial, um, it's, a, it's a safe and well-tolerated, no serious adverse events related to the study drug. And uh, there are a uh, couple of essays, but most of them are related to surgical procedures, and they got resolved within days to weeks. So how do you measure what is clinically beneficial for these patients? You know, if you look at, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, peripheral vision loss, if these patients have 50 or 60% vision left, if I can stabilize it, that's phenomenal for these patients. If I can improve it, that's like reversing, that'll be even better. And uh, most of the drugs we get approved by controlling disease progression compared to control group. So I think these are the things we need to look, preserving, slowing the progression to improving and reversing. These are all the things we have to observe in these patients to understand creatively how these patients can be benefited, how we measure them during the clinical trials. So our goal is to stabilize. And uh, so what we did is in a phase one, two trial, we're looking at the responder analysis. Obviously, we don't have a control group. Um, and this, these are treated eyes. In phase three, we'll have a control group, a separate group. And so that's why it's very difficult to um, measure the degeneration compared to control. So what we measure is stabilizing or improving. So again, from clinically meaningful, if you look at BCVA, four letters is clinically meaningful. Then you look at two categories, four or seven. And the five letters are 10 letters in case of low light. And uh, then there are like zero to seven. Point one is very, very low, almost, you know, in even a new moon light to really bright sun is zero. So if you can show improvement in the, you know, um, mobility course, um, that's, that's truly your function and quality of life improvement. So what we did, um, there are some patients past six months, some past nine, some past 12. So we looked at the conglomerate of those patients, taking all the data together, and they look at three different measures. And eight out of 12 either stabilized or improved in all three measures. I mean, that's very encouraging. And in summary, 10 out of 12 subjects developed either stabilization or improvement on one of the measures. And uh, also, the most important thing is six out of seven rhodopsin in mutation patients showed stabilization or improvement. This is important. Why? Rhodopsin is over 10% of entire RP. Like if RP has 100,000 patients, your rhodopsin mutations consists of like more than 10,000 patients. So that's a gene agnostic approach. Some of the mutations we are studying are some people have this master gene defect, NR23. One would say, okay, this is like traditional gene therapy. 
So we took the biggest mutation, which is autosomal dominant, very difficult to treat, and we're showing majority of these people are responding to our therapy. So that's again uh, proving the gene agnostic um, therapy is working. So it has potential to treat all these patients with a single uh, gene therapy product. And so where are we? As I mentioned, we have meetings with FDA, then following that, we'll meet with EMA. Our goal is if they agree with our approach, a creative approach for endpoints in phase three, and where we are, we'll proceed into the phase three. Our goal is to get the product to the market by 2026. And for broad indications with the US and followed by EMA and global. And so the next program, now I'm going to go into diseases that affect you know, millions, starting with dry age-related macular degeneration. In the late stage of GA, uh, late stage of DMD is geographic atrophy. You start forming these lesions and, uh, in the central vision, and the patients get desperate. Currently, uh, there are two products which got approved. Uh, it's a significant unmet medical need in the last one year. And uh, they target complement system. That's one pathway. There are four different pathways in you know, this disease, like a causes, lipid metabolism, um, inflammation, oxidative stress, and then um, complement system. So our another master gene based on RORA, which is OCU410, can address all these, control all these pathways. So we believe current therapies are good. They have to give multiple injections. They also have a significant uh, um, SAEs. Uh, Seven to 12 percent of the patients can get NeoVASC um, by treating for two years. So the, they are reducing the degeneration compared to control moderately. However, we have potential therapy, single injection curative therapy, rather than for life. So we're really excited with the data we have. And uh, I mean, this is, again, four different pathways or causes of the disease. And uh, this uh, gene therapy, looking at the decrease in the drusen compared to control significance, that's uh, caused by lipid metabolism, the deposits. At the bottom, you're looking at uh, you know, uh, antioxidative properties of this uh, gene, Aurora, compared to other nuclear hormone receptor genes in our family. And the next one is an anti-inflammatory effect in the models. And the last one is uh, complement activation. So in this one, if you look at uh, the middle on the right picture, um, the untreated animals, you know, they have the ABCA4 mutation. They cannot produce CD59. So we didn't give a gene therapy to produce CD59. We gave a modifier gene, which regulates the entire system, and they're producing CD59. So once again, we're demonstrating this concept works. First company to take this concept into the clinical trials globally. So there's a phenomenal potential for this. So with that, I'm going to spend uh, a minute on our neocart. Um, there is a significant uh, unmet medical need in cartilage repair space. I bet you know everybody sitting in this room, everybody, somebody, some family member has a cartilage knee or shoulder problems. And uh, when you have cartilage lesions, if untreated, you know you can end up with osteoarthritis. There are a million arthro uh, scopic surgery is conducted every year in the US. So what we have is a, um, uh, the current therapy in the market, it's a 2D, you have a scaffold, you get uh, chondrocytes, they're cartilage cells, and you grow them, you send it back. What we have is a, we have these uh, proprietary bioreactors, we accelerate the conditions like how your natural knee produces chondrocytes. And uh, six to eight weeks, we send it back. We actually develop a 3D. So when you have a lesion, you need a mature cells, like natural cells. That's what we do. We grow them in a 3D, and you can put it back. And so um, we have a um, good design with FDA. Uh, we have an agreement. And uh, the, just like you know, many of uh, folks gave um, talks here, uh, it's a very complex process, as you know, cell and gene therapies. What we did, we are developing our own cell therapy facilities in uh, Pennsylvania uh, next to our head office. And the facility will be ready by the end of the year. Next year, we'll qualify, and we'll be ready to take it to phase three clinical trial. We're very excited about it. I mean, this is just the beginning of the cartilage repairs for knees, and we can go to uh, other areas in orthopedic area. So with that, you know, we, we're very excited. We'll have two phase three programs next year, one in cell therapy, one in gene therapy. And uh, we're hopeful we'll get some preliminary results from our dry AMD program for geographic atrophy. With that, thank you. I'll be available to answer any questions.